Hello, my name is Jeff Kynart, and today I'm going to talk to you about the basics of commercial vegetables. Why would somebody be interested in growing vegetables? Why might they start this as a commercial venture? There are a lot of different reasons. Some of them we've listed here. Vegetables offer a much greater income potential when compared to grain crop uh, counterparts. Um, that comes with a trade-off. You know, uh, you know, we might be able to get ten thousand dollars an acre for tomatoes which is much higher than what we would expect for an acre of corn or soybeans, but we're also going to have a much higher labor demand to raise that acre of tomatoes. There is this trade-off where we don't have to have a $250,000 combine, but we do have to have a strong back to get all the work done. So there are lower equipment costs, but much higher labor demands. Vegetables offer a good alternative or addition to row crops, and particularly this addition we'll talk about in just a second. Um, you know, we may have a situation where we have uh, a family farm that's occupying four or five hundred acres. Everybody's getting along fine. As the oldest child in that family decides that they need to have uh, a family of their own and, and all of the income required to make that happen, then we may see them remove, you know, ten acres out of that four hundred existing acres and devote that ten acres to specialty crop production so that uh, we can have a viable enterprise and make enough income for both uh, the original family and and the new family member that is also making a living from the farm operation. Vegetable crops also allow for a viable operation to be formed on much smaller acres. Let's say we only have access to uh, four or five acres. We don't have a 500 acre farm. Um, with utilizing specialty crops and including vegetables, it does allow us the opportunity to have a viable operation on this smaller land mass. It also does afford diversification of existing row crop operations. If, if growers are interested in spreading risk, uh, then they can do that through vegetable production. Another reason to grow vegetables is over the course of the last 10 years, and particularly the last five or six years, there has been a great increase in the demand for local food. We have a lot more farmers markets in the state now than we had 10 years ago. In addition to that, restaurants, grocery stores, food service companies, and even government institutions like schools are all wanting to purchase locally grown commodity. And in many cases, there's not enough locally grown produce to meet the needs uh, that, that these places have. In some areas, the demand is, is quite a bit greater than the ability to supply. And so if an opportunity exists to grow things profitably, then you might want to consider uh, producing those crops. Another nice thing about vegetables is that it can start out relatively small, and it can actually be a part-time operation while we keep our current vocation so that we have some income stability while we're transitioning into becoming uh, a farmer. Successful operations tend to have a number of characteristics in common. We've listed some of those. Uh, first and foremost is that successful operations always have a goal of producing the highest quality produce. They do a good job in terms of being very effective in their crop management and pest management strategies. Um, they harvest things in a timely fashion. They utilize good and safe handling and post-harvest handling practices and they bring only top quality produce to the market. In addition to that, they tend to know their markets both in terms of the types and the quantities of produce that they're going to be able to market successfully. They know what times of the year they need to bring the produce and what kind of price they can anticipate receiving for that. That allows them to do a lot in terms of planning uh, so that they can be successful in their overall operation. When we talk about knowing your markets, that means things like, you know, there are some regional preferences. For example, in parts of Illinois, straight neck squash is sold almost exclusively and it's difficult to sell crook neck. In other parts of the state, the reverse of that is true. You might also want to look at, you know, if you're going to a farmer's market, when we look at the clientele, the population that surrounds that farmer's market, what is the ethnic makeup of the potential clientele? Are there some ethnic uh, specialty vegetables that are not being grown, that are not readily available at the market? If so, that might be a great opportunity for you to come in uh, and, and have a ready-made marketplace for you just by simply growing those things that consumers are wanting. 
I think right behind the importance of quality would be strong work ethic. Uh, you either have to be a very hard, very hard worker yourself, or have access to a great labor pool, or probably in all reality, uh, the successful operations are both. The guy who is the proprietor or gal who is the proprietor has a very strong work ethic and they tend to be very organized and really good at making the best use of the labor pool that they have available. As you get started, we would hope that you might start small and expand as you increase your knowledge and experience. It is definitely possible that first year or two for you to exceed your capacity to market and that is a critical mistake that we would like no one to make if we can help that. And it's an awful good idea that before you get any bigger, try to get better. Um, we would rather do the best job we can and realize the most efficiencies before making our operation larger in size and scope. If possible, start with crops that you have some experience with growing and, and beware that in many cases, commercial production practices may be somewhat variable from the way things are done in a home garden setting. So gain comfort with commercial production systems and comfort in your ability to market before you expand your enterprise. To begin a small farm enterprise, you will need the following. I mean, you're going to have to have land. How much depends upon a lot of different things. Your desired goal, the crop that you're raising, the markets that you have access to. But, you know, it it's, could be anywhere from a quarter or half an acre to maybe as much as 10 acres for someone starting out if they had a fair amount of experience. Um, but you do have to have access to land. You do have to have some equipment and machinery. But that really does vary from operation to operation in terms of both the size of the operation and the crops that are being grown. In some cases, you might be able to start if, if all we're going to raise is, is strawberries, on a half an acre or, or tomatoes on half an acre. You know, we may be able to do almost all of that with hand tools with the exception of, you know, the initial groundwork might require a rototiller or a tractor and an implement to initially do beginning ground preparation. But after that, the entire rest of the um, growing season can be handled with simply hand, access to hand tools, things like hoes and hammers and shovels and those kinds of things. The beginning small farm enterprise will definitely need the capacity to do hand labor and probably also to manage labor. Uh, you'll have to have at least some capital. The amount varies by crop and the scale of the operation. And startup cost for small scale vegetable production tends to be relatively low. And for vegetables, the return on that investment of capital tends to be relatively quick. You know, for example, if we're going to outlay money for a tomato crop, we we'll probably start getting returns on that investment, you know, 60 days after the investments were all made, as opposed to something like strawberries, which could be as long as a year and a quarter before we get any return on investment, and something like blueberries, it may be 36 months before we get any return on investment. So you do have to have capital to start a vegetable enterprise, but part of the beauty of vegetables is typically that capital is tied up for a shorter period of time as compared to many of the other specialty crop options that exist. In addition, a small farm enterprise will need a basic understanding of markets that are available to them and the current and potential demands for crops that are going to be grown. We need to know, you know, where are we going to sell this and about how much can we sell? What is the demand for that crop so that we don't flood our market and wind up actually exceeding uh, production with what we're able to when you're first starting out, you don't have some of the things that more experienced growers have the luxury of having in place. First and foremost of those would be experience growing vegetables as a profit-making business. Additionally, we don't have the knowledge of the growing practices for uh, most of the specific vegetables that we might be thinking about raising. Um, we may not have all of the specific equipment that we need when we're first getting started and in some cases we may, may not be able to afford that equipment till the second or third year and so we have to do a lot of hand labor because we don't have a specific piece of equipment. At the beginning you also don't have an established market and that's probably the scariest thing uh, as you contemplate getting started in, in uh, a vegetable enterprise is you know am I going to be able to sell all of this for a profit? And, and 
you know, honestly, you're not going to know that. You do have to take some leap of faith. You ab absolutely want to do as much homework and, and have an understanding of what's the size of the markets in your area, uh, how much produce are they moving, where can I go with stuff. You, you know, you want to know all of those things and have done your homework, but you become established in the marketplace only by becoming established in the marketplace. So at the beginning, there will be some leap of faith that has to be conducted. As we're talking to people about getting started in vegetables or fruit for that matter, record keeping is of paramount importance. You need to keep track of all of the income, all of the expenses. You need to be able to file your sales tax documents on time to the appropriate places. We need to keep track of labor to make sure that we're handling payroll so that we're legal and not cheating anyone. We need to take good notes on field production information. This is really, really important. What varieties did I plant? Okay, I planted this field to tomatoes, and I planted uh, Florida 47s and Florida 91s. They were planted on this date. Uh, you want to keep track of all those kinds of informations. You want to know, make notes of any specific environmental conditions. Part of this field flooded on uh, July the 2nd. What pesticides did I use? What days were they applied? Were they effective? These Field production notebooks are such huge references as you go about subsequent years, you really will find it hard to believe how much you turn back to them. It's very common to sit around in the spring going, now how many tomato plants did we plant last year? Now what date did we set those? I wish we'd have set them 10 days earlier. You can go back to last year's notebook and look and it shows right there. Here's what day I set the plants. I'll move that date back. Additionally, good record keeping allows you to price your produce so that you can get a return on all of your investment, and that includes how much time you spent doing things. You absolutely need to price things so that you're getting a return on your investment of labor. Uh, otherwise, it's really not uh, a great way to spend your time. We also need to think in the beginning about some business planning. Some of the things, and again, we'll cover all of these in more detail in future classes, but things that we should be thinking about as we contemplate starting a vegetable enterprise. We need to have insurance. We need to have, you know, traditional crop insurance is probably not obtainable for most of these things, but there are alternatives that we'll discuss. We need to have liability insurance, and not just liability insurance for our farm, but also for uh, the product that we're taking to the marketplace and selling. We need to think about labor. We have to have be in compliance with minimum wage, worker safety uh, standard, workman's compensation, those kinds of things. We need to think about taxes and accounting. You know, if you've not farmed before, this will be your first year to fill out a Schedule F. You need to have kept all the records so that you know what your expenses were. We need to talk about getting our sales tax again filed in a timely fashion to the right place. We need to think about food safety. We don't want to make anyone sick. We want to have good farm safety plan and good ag practices. We want to think about zoning. Are we going to build a greenhouse or a high tunnel? If so, we have to make sure that where we're planning on constructing it is zoned so that we can legally have a high tunnel or a greenhouse at that specific location. We need to think about what is our, our structure of our business going to be. Is it going to be a corporation, a partnership, uh, a limited liability corporation? What is going to be the structure of the business that we're going to For marketing, in Illinois, there tends to be two ways that most of the produce is marketed. Um, there are cooperatives that exist, but there are not very many cooperatives in the state of Illinois. In general, we're going to have direct marketing and wholesale marketing, and most people that are in the beginning phases tend to rely more on direct marketing. And in all honesty, we've seen a shift over the last 20 years away from wholesale marketing so that even the very large operations tend to do a higher percent of direct marketing although they still retain some wholesale marketing activities as well. Direct marketing is selling things directly to the consumer and these include things like farmers markets or you know retailing on the farm at a farm stand for example and over the course of the last 10 years we've seen a great amount of growth in this 
CSAs or community supported agriculture where people pay a subscription fee to your farm and then each week they get a percent of the produce that is harvested. In addition to direct marketing avenues, there are also wholesale marketing opportunities, and these would include things like produce auctions or terminal markets, or perhaps you're going to sell some to your local grocery store or restaurants in the area, and even some institutions like hospitals, nursing homes, and schools may purchase from you if you decide to go into the vegetable production business. Again, you know, as you're starting out, people tend to be more on the direct marketing side. And then as the operation matures, we will see them use a blend of direct market and wholesale marketing techniques. At a farmer's market, appearances make a sale. Make sure that your displays are neat and attractive with clean, high quality produce. Just because something is of such quality that you might be able to eat it doesn't mean that it's of such quality that you want to take it to town, show it off, and try to market it. We would really like to take only the finest and best produce to the marketplace when we can. By delivering a quality product, that tends to result in customer loyalty. If a consumer is happy with the product they bought from you last week and they want tomatoes again this week, it's quite likely that they're going to seek you out at the farmer's market and purchase from you again. It is important that we have clearly marked prices so that there's no hard feelings, there's no misunderstanding of you know, what it is that we're selling and at what price. And provide as wide a variety of produce as is practical for your operation. And again, at the beginning, your uh, varieties may be somewhat limited as you become more established and more familiar with growing practices for additional crops, then we would likely have a greater variety as you gain more experience. Be friendly, clean, and courteous when you're selling at the farmer's market. If you have overhead shelters, it helps. It helps keep the people that are buying from you comfortable, and it also keeps your produce in much better condition than if it's sitting out there in the hot sun. In some cases, we can provide samples. In some cases, we can't. Those rules vary a little bit by what the commodity is. Is it something that we can just hand them a sample, or is it something that has to be sliced? Because if it's something that has to be sliced, like a watermelon, for example, then probably in most places that's going to require you have a food handler's license uh, and you've gone to food sanitation class. It also varies a little bit in terms of this providing samples from market to market as far as does the market master allow these things to happen or not. It's a good idea to provide point of purchase pieces, things like recipe and preparation tips, and make sure that you know, you're know you in compliance with the market rules, that you have liability insurance, including product liability, that you're not violating health department rules. Another thing that you may not have considered, but if you're selling things by the pound, the scales that you're using must be certified by the Illinois Department of Ag, unless you're in the County of Cook, and then there's a different certifying agent. Make sure that your measurements for containers uh, are such that you are actually um, legally selling what it is that it says. In other words, if it says a half peck container, um, make sure that it really is capable of holding a half peck and uh, do collect sales tax and and turn it another thing as we consider starting a vegetable production uh, enterprise is we have to make a decision are we going to be conventional and that's not a word that i really like very much but conventional versus organic usually that's a decision based on one's personal opinion Organic crops usually command a higher price, but tend to have lower yields in terms of a per acre basis uh, when compared to conventional counterparts. Producing crops organically usually requires more expense and a lot more hand labor. And certification is required if your operation is going to exceed $5,000 in sales and you identify your produce as organic. As you're first starting out, it's likely that you will not have $5,000 in sales. So that first year or two, you may not be required to be certified, but you still need to comply by all of the rules as set forth uh, by USDA for what is required for organic production.
far as some of the information or where you can find that, uh, there is an Illinois Organic Growers Association that also provides some of the rules and regulations associated with organic production. As we think about starting an enterprise, we need to think about equipment. Equipment needs vary by the size of the operation and what the crop is that's being raised. A small operation, as we talked about earlier, may only require hand tools and perhaps the access to a tiller at the very beginning for initial ground preparation. In other cases, we're going to require multiple tractors and things like transplanters, sprayers, plastic mulch layers. Uh, again, we can start small and as the operation grows, add additional components. Greenhouses and high tunnels, particularly high tunnels, are a piece of equipment that we see on more and more enterprises. And you may not be able to afford one the first year or two, um, but it may be part of what your plans are or what your plans should be as your operation grows and matures. Basic field equipment things like hand tools, uh, hoes, shovels, trowels, those kinds of things. Tillers typically walk behind, although tractor mounted ones are, are awfully nice and they're something that we tend to see operations purchase after they've been in business two or three years. Other kinds of equipment that might be required, things like a tractor, a planter, plastic mulch layer, transplanter. We probably need to have some packing or at least washing equipment available to take care of the produce after we've harvested it. We may have a cultivator, we may have a sprayer, you know, a small operation that may simply be uh, a small two or three gallon sprayer that we hand pump up and carry around to make our applications. As the operation gets bigger, we can move to things that are you know, several thousand dollar sprayers that uh, um, are air blast sprayers uh, that do a great job of making applications of fungicides and insecticides. So some of these things we may start small and as our operation expands and we have more capital, uh, and then we can increase the, the quality and the types of equipment that are available to us. You may need to have a fertilizer spreader again in the very beginning. That may consist, consist of fertilizer spreading may be done by a bucket in your hands as the operation grows. Um, you know, you may actually buy a cone type spreader that mounts on the back of a tractor. There are lots of other kinds of equipment that, that might be needed. And one of the things about specialty crops is that it's not at all uncommon to find growers that have engineered their own piece of equipment that does specifically what it is that they and Again, we'll talk about equipment. We'll have a whole class devoted to some of the equipment associated with specialty crop production. But this is kind of a neat slide to give you, you know, sometimes it's not always that simple. Here are five very different kinds of hose that exist. And, you know, they kind of each have their own purpose and their own area that they really shine in. And, uh, uh, you know, which one of these are you going to want or which which couple of three of these are you going to want? And things like planters, and these are all hand planters. Then we could move up to tractor mounted planters and add a whole bunch more pictures of different kinds of things. But, you know, the planet junior cedar in the upper right uh, or the earthway cedar in the bottom left are things that you typically see. Um, and they work well for getting started. As your operation becomes more advanced or you decide to specialize in greens or carrots or something like this, then the Johnny Six Row Cedar that you see in the bottom right or the Jang Cedar in the upper left uh, may be where you move next. And then ultimately you may wind up buying a tractor mounted uh, something like a Monosem uh, or a Stanhay that, that is the tractor mounted equipment that actually does a great job in singulating seed, anything from seeds as small as onions to things as large as, as pumpkin seed. Here are some other examples of equipment from, uh, these are all pictures from Southern Illinois. We still uh, do have a few people that cultivate with, with a horse. Um, there's a horse reddish digger in the bottom left hand picture. There's a sprayer that would be used on a larger established vegetable farm in the upper right. And, you know, it's pretty common for growers in their second or third year to decide to start using raised beds and plastic mulch if they're raising vegetables. And the picture in the bottom right-hand corner is a picture of a mulch. Layer. And, you know, we'll go over some of the equipment needs and, and it'll be the whole course of another talk later in this series. 
other sorts of equipment needs, soil thermometers, you know, we don't really want to plant shrunken sweet corn until the soil temperatures have warmed in the spring of the year. We're going to have to think about irrigation and things like supply lines, drip tape, backflow preventers. We're going to need harvesting and marketing equipment and what it is that we need on what the crop is that we're raising. In some cases, we may need things like spades or, or knives. Uh, we're going to have to have tubs, totes, hampers, some way to get the produce from the field back to the packing shed, some place where we're actually going to do our packing and cleaning of the produce before we take it to market. We may have equipment for season extension. And at the beginning, the first year, that may just be row covers or maybe low tunnels and row covers. But as we get... Um, a little more capital and a little more experience, then we're probably going to transition to utilization of things like high tunnels. We would like to have access to coolers and we are seeing increasingly the use of air conditioners uh, in conjunction with a cool bot. We just take a room in our, our machine shed or packing shed, insulate it pretty heavily and install a, install a cool bot with an air conditioner and utilize that for our walk-in coolage needs particularly as we are first getting started. What kinds of equipment you're going to need? There's a neat chart. The website's given here from Atra that talks about, you know, here are some of the equipments that are appropriate depending on the size of operation. In other words, you know, what I can do if I'm only going to raise one or two acres or something, I can do a whole lot of that by hand. But as I start getting to trying to raise eight, nine, ten acres, then I'm going to need um, perhaps a little bit less hand labor and a little more uh, mechanical labor when mechanical options are available. And this is a neat chart that shows you sort of the uh, what we tend to see on various sized vegetable farm operations in terms of their equipment. Uh, another question that you're going to have that first year, you know, what crops do I raise? Well, it's probably best answered by what crops do consumers that are going to frequent your operation wish to purchase. You want to grow those crops which are going to be the easiest to raise and offer the greatest return on investment. You know, think about what crop is going to be easily raised and sold. You know, things like tomatoes, sweet corn, melons, those tend to have a ready base of customers that are going to purchase them. What crops provide the best return? Well, if you happen to be in an area where there's a farmer's market that is particularly rich in one ethnic group or another, maybe instead of raising the traditional tomatoes, sweet corn, melons, maybe you would be better off finding something that is not well represented at the farmer's market that is in high demand. That would be a crop that would provide a really good return. Another consideration in terms of what are you going to grow, what crops do you feel comfortable with growing? If, you know, if there's uh, three or four choices out there that you feel would work out really well at your local market, but you're really comfortable with raising one of them over the other two. Probably that's where you should start. Another consideration is, you know, what crop fits in with the land, labor, capital, and equipment resources that I have available to me. Some of these crops are much more intensive in terms of the amount of capital. For example, you know, if I want to set an acre of strawberries on black plastic, I've got to outlay $7,000 an acre. Uh, if I want to outlay some sweet corn, you know, I'm looking at, you know, a few hundred dollars an acre instead of several thousand dollars an acre. So what crop fits in with your capital, land, labor, and equipment resources? In Illinois, sort of the major vegetable crops that we find Sweet corn, cucurbit crops, things like pumpkin, squash, and melons, green beans, tomatoes. Uh, horseradish is a huge crop in Illinois, although I wouldn't recommend that you go home necessarily and start your operation by becoming a big horseradish grower, uh, but it is a very major crop in the state of Illinois. Other crops that we see in Illinois, greens for all different kinds of, of uh, salad greens. Onions, potatoes, asparagus, coal crops, things like uh, cabbage and broccoli, peppers, beets, carrots, peas, uh, radishes, spinach. You know, there are all kinds of crops, kind of everything from asparagus to zucchini we see raised. In 
here's sort of a list of some of the crops that uh, uh, are grown in the state, and it tells whether or not they're suitable for retail marketing or wholesale marketing, what their labor and equipment requirements are, and what their pest pressures tend to be. Something like asparagus works out really well for both retail and wholesale marketing. It is medium in its labor requirement in that it doesn't require much labor other than harvesting labor, but that harvesting labor all has to be done by hand, and asparagus grows right next to the ground. So you have to bend over to pick every single piece that you market. It doesn't require a whole lot in terms of equipment, and it tends to have not very many pest problems, as opposed to something like cauliflower, which is also suitable for retail and wholesale marketing, but it has a high labor requirement. It does require some specialized equipment, and you know, in this case, it's a sprayer, and the tendency to have pest problems is relatively high. Um, again, that doesn't mean we can't raise it organically. It's just that we have to use organic, the you know, pesticide materials that are on the OMRI approved materials list. Um, but it does tend to have a high degree of pests. So this is kind of a neat chart that shows you some of the crops and and what the labor equipment and pest management. This is a neat publication. It's it's uh, uh, certainly a little bit old, but. I know in all honesty, a tomato hasn't changed a whole lot over the course of the last 50 years. So uh, this is a neat vegetable planning guide publication that you can uh, download. And it particularly nice for people that are getting started out. It tells you kind of what you're going to need in terms of um, the number of seeds or the number of plants in the case where we're transplanting something per 100 foot of row. It gives you some idea of spacing both in the row and between the row and tells you a little bit uh, about how long it takes for that crop from the time it's planted until the time it's harvested. This information is really useful when you're doing your initial planning uh, and you're in a situation where you're getting started and you're new to Then after we kind of have that side of it where we, we know how much seed it's going to take and, and how we're going to space it, then sort of the next thing is what sorts of yields can we expect? And here's a neat um, website from Rutgers. Um, you can go to it and download a PDF of yields we might expect to receive from the various crops. Once you have decided actually what crop we're going to raise, for example, I've decided I'm going to raise tomatoes. Well, there are tons of tomato varieties or cultivars that are available and which variety are we going to grow or which cultivar we're we going to grow and and beware that you know not all cultivars are the same they vary in their response to the environment their growth habit the shape of the fruit you know am i going to raise a cherry tomato am i going to raise a beefsteak they vary in their overall yield how long it takes them to mature in the case of again just in the case of tomatoes you know, is it going to be a red tomato, a yellow tomato, or a pink tomato? In the case of sweet corn, is it going to be white, bicolor, or yellow? Cultivars also vary in terms of their flavor and nutritional value. There's also a great deal of variance in some cases as far as disease and insect resistance. There's also differences in their post-harvest stability. You know, is this tomato really soft? And if I put more than two of them in a basket, do they wind up smashing each other? Or is it a firm tomato? Um, and because there's so much variability in the cultivars, there also is variability in terms of, you know, some of them have great profit potential and, and others have less so. You know, in some parts of the state, some of the heirloom tomatoes, for example, like Brandywine, um, they may sell for an awful lot on a per pound basis, but because they tend to be so soft and because they tend to have such problems with cracking, you know, in the southern part of the state, uh, it's pretty difficult for, to, for, for a grower to raise that crop profitably because the yields of marketable fruit tend to be so small. So bars and variety based on research reports like the Midwest Vegetable Variety Trial Report by talking with uh, other farmers in the area that you trust um, by looking through uh, seed catalogs but then actually talking with the representative that services your region of the United States 
go to extension programs and find out what varieties are doing well in your area. Also, again, we talked earlier about keeping good records. Make sure you keep notes on, you know, I planted this variety last year and it didn't do well at all, but I also planted another variety that did great. Make sure you know what variety you planted where and whether it performed well or not. Do look at things like disease resistance. Disease resistance is wonderful. You know, we, we can find something that has good disease resistance package that eliminates the likelihood of uh, having crop failure from that particular disease. And in addition, it tends to reduce the amount of pesticide that has to be utilized. Um, hardiness will vary depending on what the crop is that we're raising. Hardy crops can be planted four weeks before the last frost in the spring, and they would be things like asparagus, cabbage, onions, peas, spinach, turnips. Semi-hardy crops can only go two weeks before the last frost. Semi-hardy things would be, you know, we plant potatoes early. We plant carrots and lettuce early. Tender crops can be planted at the time of the last frost, and they would be things like green beans and corn, although on corn it depends on what type of corn that we're raising. Shrunken corn should probably be a little bit later than that because they have trouble germinating in cold soils. Very tender crops are planted two weeks after the last frost date in the spring, and those would include warm season vegetables like sweet potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, those kinds of things. When is the last frost? Remember that there are charts that you can always get the average frost-free date in the state of Illinois. And it is kind of surprising. Illinois is a tremendously long state. If you'll look, there's three weeks difference in growing season uh, when the growing season begins from the uh, northern part of the state to the southern part. Your average first frost in the fall. And again, you know, there's two weeks difference here between the northern and southern. So, you know, the southern part of the state has, you know, five weeks longer growing season than the northern part. So you're looking at basically a full month difference from north to south. Now, if we want to go beyond that frost-free date, if we want to cheat and start having, uh, and where we most commonly see this is, is, for example, trying to have tomatoes a month earlier than we could have them if we were to grow outside, then we would use some season extension techniques. Season extension is methods of protecting crops from the cold in the spring and the fall, thus extending the growing season. It's very beneficial for increasing the diversity of crops early in the market season. Um, it does have some disadvantage in that we have the expense of the structure. And, and typically for a 30 by 96 high tunnel, you're looking at somewhere between five dollars and $10,000, depending on the quality of structure that you erect. But that disadvantage is uh, weighed against the advantages of having higher prices for earlier products also, high tunnels tend to have decreased disease issues, and there is another thing, and, and that is we talked earlier about customers tend to have some loyalty. If they were happy with the tomatoes they bought from you last week, they're likely going to come and buy tomatoes from you again this week. Well, if you use a high tunnel and you're the first in the market or one of the first in the marketplace to have fresh, locally grown tomatoes, that gives you a leg up on some of the other people that will be selling tomatoes later in the season. You know, the customers have already been buying tomatoes from you for the last three or four weeks because you've been racing in a high tunnel. Chances are they're going to continue to buy through from you throughout the summer. Okay, some of the season extension things you see, row covers that you see down there in, in the bottom being used to form a low tunnel. Um, and in the upper right-hand picture, you're seeing a low tunnel being constructed what you're seeing in the bottom left are actual low tunnels inside of a high tunnel structure. Um, the high tunnel structure itself only probably affords you two or three degrees of, of uh, protection over ultimate nighttime low temperatures. And so it tends to be we will use low tunnels inside of the high tunnel, particularly very early in the spring or very late in the fall, uh, where we're having temperatures that are in the... Um, mid to lower 20s or even lower. By using low tunnels in addition to or inside of the high tunnels, you know, I have personally seen tomatoes protected as low as 16 degree outside temperature, 
uh, and the tomatoes survived inside of the tunnel where we were using low tunnels inside of the high tunnel structure. And there are some pictures of, of again, some other low tunnels. And we should talk a little bit about fall crops. Most people don't take advantage of the fall season. And in part, I think that is that some things that are very easily marketed by being the first on the block with them are not necessarily as easily marketed being the last person in the marketplace with them. Um, but there is some potential for fall cropping that probably is um, underutilized at this point in much of Illinois. Cool season crops like uh, cold crops, leafy greens, uh, are great fall crop candidates. They do present some special challenges. Um, we tend to perhaps have some additional insect pressures in the fall of the year. You know, the pest populations have built up over the whole summertime. We also have some additional challenges in terms of trying to find plants. It's really easy to find a broccoli transplant early in the season. It's pretty difficult to find a broccoli transplant in July or August when you would set them for a fall crop. And so sometimes finding a source of transplants can be a, a real challenge to being successful in a fall cropping operation. Um, trying to manage uh, water is also um, more challenging for fall crops than it is for spring crops. If we were going to do things like beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, cauliflowers, and beans, we, you know, we could plant those actually in, in mid-July and have a nice fall crop. Um, we can plant things like lettuce, spinach, and turnip in mid to late August, depending on what part of the state you're in. And in some cases, we will have to have some frost protection for these fall crops, but typically that can be afforded through just the use of we do have to decide whether to transplant or direct seed, and, and I'll be honest with you, that really varies more by crop than anything else, but transplants give you a head start on the season compared to direct seeding, and, and for example, in the state of Illinois, all of the tomatoes are going to be transplanted tomatoes. We don't direct seed any tomatoes here. Uh, if you were in California, that wouldn't be the case, but in Illinois, you know, pretty much all the tomatoes are going to be the result of planting a transplant. Um, transplants um, allow you to avoid things like uh, depredation of the seed by various um, bird, mammalian, and insect pests. Um, direct seeding is probably uh, cheaper than transplanting, but in many cases it's not very successful, so it doesn't do you uh, any good and you don't really afford any benefit by, by going with the direct seeded option. Some plants that do tend to be direct seeded, uh, we, you know, we can direct seed beets and carrots and, and lettuce. You know, we direct seed sweet corn routinely. You know, there are a few sweet corn transplant set, but the vast majority of sweet corn in the state is grown by being direct seeded. But again, that kind of decision as to whether or not we're going to transplant or direct seed typically depends on the crop. Um, common crops and how we're going to be planting them. Transplanted crops, tomatoes, peppers, coal crops, sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes. Direct seeded crops would include sweet corn, green beans, lettuce, beets, peas. On cucurbits, we can do either way. You know, you can, um, and it's common that some growers would actually use both ways. Their very earliest squash, they might set transplants. And for later subsequent succession planted plantings of squash, those might become direct seeded as we go further. We will have an entire uh, session talking about transplant production. Um, but if you're wanting to grow your own transplants, if you grow your own, it allows you to plant the varieties that you want and have them available when you want them. It does, however, require space to grow the transplants, typically a greenhouse and specific knowledge and time to grow the transplant. So we've got some additional labor requirements as well as some additional equipment requirements if you're wanting to grow your own transplants. And again, we'll talk about that in, in uh, uh, much greater detail going to have a vegetable farm you know there are sort of some ideal sites for vegetable farms and some that are less ideal in many cases we're dealing with people that already have a piece of land and so this becomes um, more of an interesting fact than you know they're not going out looking for a piece of property to grow vegetables on they already own a piece of property and we're trying to make it work but if we were going to 
actually go through the process of choosing a site to, to raise vegetables on. We would look at things like soil type and fertility. All soils are not equal in terms of their productivity and their ability to grow vegetables. Uh, soil type can impact what types of vegetables can be successfully grown. And, and it also changes things like the amount of fertilizer that has to be utilized and, and the amount of water that's going to be required during the growing season. We should also know the cropping history where we're going to raise our vegetable crops on, know what's been grown there in the past and what pesticides have been used. There are some herbicides that can carry over for as long as two years or even more. And we need to know what's been put on that ground in the course of the last three or four years. We'd like to know its fertility history, its cropping history, and its herbicide and insecticide history. Site elevation, you know, if we can have a site that is uh, more elevated than the surrounding ground around it, then that site tends to be um, less subject to early uh, fall frost or late spring frost problems. Um, but, you know, those sites also tend to be more droughty than bottom ground sites. Bottomland sites tend to have more frost issues, but they tend to be more successful if we don't have access to irrigation water. So there is some trade-off with elevation for vegetables. Pest management considerations and pests would include weed disease and insect problems. You know, we're going to talk again another session and devoted entirely to pest management, but we would like to see people utilize integrated pest management practices, meaning that we rely on more than one particular strategy for controlling the pest. We don't rely on just a pesticide, even if we're in an organic uh, uh, production uh, scheme. It doesn't really matter if it's organic or conventional. We would like to use multiple strategies for controlling weed pests or insect pests. Uh, you know, for example, we don't rely on just insecticides, but we might use things like uh, rotation and for the case of insects. For disease, you know, practice good sanitation, buy disease-free transplants and get disease-free seed, um, depending on if we're going to use a seed or transplant for the crop. Don't rely on just pest control chemicals, but rather a more encompassing uh, approach to managing. Crop rotation is a big deal. Uh, try to rotate fields, you know, three years between crop families if you can to avoid disease pressures. Typically, most diseases, if it affects one member of a plant family, it will affect other members of the plant family. There are some other diseases that go across many plant families. Some things like Phytophthora and Fusarium really go across a lot of different plant families. And in those cases, rotation is probably um, not as useful of a tool in controlling the pest um, as it is in cases where the specific disease tends to stay kind of relegated to a single plant family. But crop rotation is a good practice. And, you know, things that we think about in terms of plant families, you know, solanaceous crops would include tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants, tobacco. All of those are in the same plant family. And so if I've grown tomatoes in this field this year, I don't want to rotate to uh, peppers next year. That's the same plant family. Instead, I would rotate to something like you know, beans or cucumbers or, or squash or, or some other plant family. A little bit about harvesting considerations. Harvesting depends somewhat upon personal preference um, in terms of, you know, when do I pick a zucchini? How small do I pick it? When do I harvest sweet corn? Some people actually like it, you know, two days further along than other individuals. And so there is some personal preference that, that goes into that in terms of what stage of maturity is harvested. Um, we would like to see people, when at all possible, to do their harvesting in the early morning during the summertime so that we don't have all of the heat that's going to accumulate. If I go out and harvest sweet corn at seven o'clock in the morning and put it in the cooler, I do a much better job at getting that corn cooled off than if I go out and harvest that same sweet corn at two o'clock in the afternoon when it has all the heat of the day already inside of the ear of corn and then I take all of that heat and pack it into the cooler and have to get rid of that heat prior to the commodity getting cooled. Uh, cool as soon as possible after we harvest things so that we reduce the uh, respiration rate. You know these 
produce is alive even after it's harvested. It continues to respire to utilize oxygen and evolve CO2. So by cooling produce down, we can we can uh, slow that rate of respiration. And, and again, that cooling is a lot why we would like to see you harvest early in the morning rather than late in the day. Uh, for most of the time, we would like to harvest as close to ripe as possible when plant sugars are at their highest. You know, a, a tomato um, that is picked, you know, at pink stage or beyond tends to have a different quality than a tomato that is picked at the breaker stage and then allowed to ripen uh, in a room. And so, in general, we would like to pick our produce as close to ripe as possible. Harvesting, make sure you're harvesting the crop at this correct stage of maturity for the given crop. In addition, be prepared to provide adequate post-harvest storage conditions for the given crop. We'll talk about that more in terms of the post-harvest storage conditions, but you know there are some things like we just don't put musk melon and green bell peppers in the same cooler, and we'll talk about why when we talk about post-harvest handling, but be prepared after you've harvested the crop to get it the correct storage conditions required prior to you actually moving it to the talk just a little bit about some of the expenses associated with vegetable crops. Biggest expense for inputs would be things like the seed or the plant, the fertilizers, pesticides, machinery, fuel, land, and other kinds of things uh, tend to make up the bulk of the input cost. Um, vegetables are much cheaper than fruit. Fruit can be as much as $7,000 an acre or more. In general, I think most vegetable crops tend to be below $4,500 an acre, and there are many that are less than $1,000 an acre to, to establish the vegetable crop. Labor is either going to be supplied by you, or if you hire others, then it's going to wind up jumping into one of the bigger input expenses that you're going to have. Marketing cost. Um, one of the things about marketing cost that includes things like packaging cost and packaging cost varies depending on how successful you are if I have a crop that does really well then I have to buy a lot more boxes to put it in and so packaging costs are, are very real but um, sometimes you really don't mind spending extra money on packaging because that means you've probably done an extra good job on production um, we also are going to have other kinds of marketing costs like advertising, constructing the roadside stand, those kinds of things. Um, we need to make sure we know all the expenses that were associated with producing our vegetable crop and make sure you don't sell too cheap. Know what it really costs you and make sure that you're getting a return on all of your investments that were associated with production of that. Here's a, a, a neat chart. This is based on last year's Quincy farmer market prices. And it kind of looks at what we would expect for a yield from 100 foot of row for a crop, what the price average was last year at the Quincy farmer's market in 2013. and gives you an idea of what the gross income is for 100 foot of row. And so then you can go back to, you know, for example, on the snap bean, you're looking at 100 to $150 uh, gross sales for a row. How many beans does it take to plant 100 foot? Well, you can go back and go look at, um, we had a PDF earlier that showed how many pounds of seed it would take to plant that row and, and get an idea of what some of the potential uh, income for these things are. But this is a really neat chart that Mike Rogge developed that, that kind of gives you gross income per 100 foot of row onto this following page here. As you start looking at other budgeting enterprise tools that are available. Um, commercial enterprise budgets for vegetables are available from a number of different places. The University of Kentucky uh, has a site called the Center for Crop Diversification and it has a lot of different crop budgets that are available. In addition to this, Ohio State University also has budgets that are available. Some other publications that might be of interest um, this is a, a book that was redone by Chuck Boyd called Vegetable Gardening in the Midwest. And it's kind of a nice uh, getting started sort of cultural overview of crops. And then as you become um, uh, more experienced and more familiar with crops, then you might transition to utilizing something like the Knotts publication is the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for Commercial Growers. 
There are new ones developed each year. Uh, this is a multi-state regional application for the Midwest and uh, it can be found at the website below and you can go in and, and it will list individual crops and it will tell you sort of what are the varieties they recommend, what are fertilizer recommendations, what are pesticides in terms of insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides that are um, allowed for use on the crop. Um, it's a very, very list of some additional resources um, that you might find interesting as you try to discover and learn more about a commercial vegetable crop. Reach, you know, Mike or myself or, or Nathan Johanning, uh, feel free to contact any of us with your vegetable questions uh, and we will be happy to uh, try to answer them in greater detail.